Hi everybody and welcome back. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Elijah Schreiber and we are going to finish up our series on self-image tonight. Uh, previously, Russ has taught about self-image uh, and God and self-image and others. How both God and other people affect our self-image. But tonight, we're going to wrap up the, the uh, discussion <laughs> by discussing self-image and sin. How our sinful natures and the sinfulness of our world affect the way we should look at ourselves. Before we begin though, you guys are going to read a couple of verses together and have a couple warm-up questions to get started. So take some time to do that with your life group. All right, welcome back. One of the first things that we learn and the verses that we read is that we have sinful natures and sinful desires. These sinful natures and desires are best dealt with by humility and submission to the Word of God. The Bible teaches us that we are naturally children of wrath and slaves to sin. This paints a picture of an evil people who are given over to evil desires and worship evil, don't even know that we're doing evil because we call it good. When we look at ourselves and ask how we should think about ourselves in light of this knowledge, we should make a distinction between before we are saved and after we are saved, before Jesus has redeemed us and after he has. Take a minute to think about what you would be if Jesus hadn't saved you. What we know is that we don't have complete freedom because we are slaves, we are servants, we are completely given over to sin and evil. We also know that we're not as good as we think because we're enemies of God. I know in my life, I've found multiple things that the Bible calls bad or evil that I don't think are bad or evil. There's times where I'm rude to someone I love, when I say something I shouldn't, when I look or listen to something I shouldn't, and I don't think it's bad. In fact, I think it's good or at the very least, neutral. But scripture makes it abundantly clear that those desires to fulfill those desires, the actions that lead me there, are evil. This has taught me that I can't trust myself and I need to be humble and submit myself to the Word of God. That even when I feel like I should do something or feel like I want to do something, I have to stick with what I know. That God is good, that He is just, and that He created a beautiful way for me to live in. And that He's explained that to me through His Word. Now, real quick, I want to make a distinction that this evilness, these, this children of wrath status that we are born with doesn't change until Jesus saves us. We'll get to that a little bit later, but don't forget about that. The second way that sin can affect your self-image is through the consequences. I'm not talking about consequences like you did something bad and so you have a punishment, like you were speeding down the road and so you get a ticket. I'm talking about the natural consequences from living in an evil and sinful world. For example, perhaps you suffer with an eating disorder. Perhaps you think you are much more overweight than you actually are, and so you're tempted to starve yourself, to hurt your body in order to fit what feels like a healthier, right, lifestyle. Or perhaps you struggle with gender dysphoria. You're a boy born as a boy who thinks that he might be a girl. Or perhaps you're a girl who was born as a girl who thinks she might be a boy. These things are difficult and, and painful to wrestle with, and they're not because you did anything wrong. They're because of maybe a chemical imbalance in your brain or the input of people or the input of society that have confused you as to what is the truth. But there's still difficult things that we have to struggle with, and there's still ways that sin can make us seem less valuable than we actually are. The best way to deal with these consequences is to trust in God and to trust in the spiritual leaders he's put in our lives. If you struggle with an eating disorder, you will only find peace in knowing that God made you who you are for a reason, that he loves you, that your value is not in a certain way you look or a certain way you feel, but in the image of God he's put in you. Your value is also found in the fact that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, that the eternal almighty father, <laughs> almighty son, sorry, <laughs> died on the cross to save you from your sins. That has put an infinite price tag on your value, something that can never be met. 
or diminished. One thing we do want to remember is that the world can influence or even encourage sinful understandings of ourselves. And it's tempting and difficult, I've experienced it, to go out in the world and hear them talk about how you should think of yourself when scripture says otherwise. And that's when we have to trust. It's not easy, and some days it's a daily choice. But we have to trust that God knows better for us than we do and than the world does. We're going to take another couple minutes to talk about some questions with our life group. And I'd like to encourage you guys, especially as we keep going, to be vulnerable with each other and open up about some of the things you struggle with and the ways your self-image has been affected by sin. Welcome back, guys. Before we end, I wanted to make sure that we took a minute to look at how Christ overcomes sin. How even though sin affects all these things about our self-image, there is a good and beautiful way that God has created us to live in and that he's offered that to us through Christ. We already talked about this briefly, but it's good to remember that we are valuable, not because of the things we do, because of what we can say, because of how we look, our talents, or our capabilities. We are valuable because we are made in the image of God and because Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us. Those two things should be the root of our identity. They should be, as Christians, the first things we look to to define our self-image and who we are. And those things cannot be eradicated by any means. It's also important that we view ourselves holistically. We are both body and spirit. God created both things and called both of them beautiful. We should care for our body and we should care for our spirit, regardless of our shortcomings. An interesting thing that we see in scripture is that our redemption, the way God works in us after we've been saved, begins in our spirit. And it begins when God gifts us our Holy Spirit. The work that God does in us starts inwardly and one day will be fully experienced physically with our resurrection bodies. But right now, we still are going through that sanctification process. It's still moving around in us and creating us to be who God created us to be. God uses these temptations, our desires, and our deformities and abnormalities to help our souls grow, to learn to trust him, and to produce holiness, as, holiness in us and make us more like Christ. One day, that'll be worked out completely in our resurrected bodies, and you'll no longer feel those sinful desires, the sinful temptations, nor will you feel the effects of sin in your body or in your mind. Those things will be healed, they will be gone. He will wipe every tear away from our eye. So what do we do now? If we, if we are looking forward to this eternal hope that we have one day, and we know that God is still like working that out in us, that it's already done, but also not yet completed and full, how do we live? Well, first of all, it's important to be realistic about your self-image and be realistic about your shortcomings. It's okay to not be perfect. It's okay to not be the most attractive person in the room. It's okay to not be the best athlete in the room. God didn't make us all to be the best athletes or the best looking. It's okay because those things are meant to make us more like Jesus. Romans chapter five, verses three through five says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts, the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We'll wrap up with a little bit more discussion time with our life groups. And again, I ask you guys to be vulnerable with each other and to trust each other. And above all, to give glory to God because you are fearfully and wonderfully made and he adores you.